I'll start off by uh, preparing the meeting to record. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the April um, Southern Fried DNN um, user group. We are thrilled to be here tonight. We've got a couple of different things that we are doing on the uh, coattails of having been at the very beginning of this month out at DNN Con in Baltimore. Uh, so towards the end of this session, we'll do a little bit of a recap, talk about the buzz, some of the things that we heard, some of the things that we're excited about. Um, and uh, we'll have some giveaways and, and things to pass out and uh, share with everybody. Uh, tonight we have Nick, who just disappeared. I, I hope he comes back again. There we go. We got Nick again. Uh, tonight we have Nick uh, Kalyani. He is going to be talking with us about machine learning. We're going to do a machine learning quick start. And uh, there are certain times when I have plenty of an idea of what we're going to be talking about, and I know the technology, I've got some passing knowledge or some deep knowledge. Tonight I have no idea what Nick's going to be talking about, and this is going to be uh, exciting, because I guarantee you, everything that Nick brings, whether he's doing it at DNN Con when it was in Florida, whether he's doing it in a presentation like this, it is always thrilling and exciting. And the last two sessions I've sat in of Nick's, they blew my mind in one way or another, and it was super exciting. So I, I expect nothing less of, uh, of tonight's session. Right, Nick? Yes. All Thanks right. for setting that bar. Good build up, right? <laughs> 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 that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, all right. So uh, just a couple of uh, structural things for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, for this meeting, we have uh, sponsors and several folks that are um, uh, that we'd like to thank because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to be here. So uh, one of the things that uh, we want to start off by mentioning, uh, which we do every few sessions, is remembering to mention uh, Michael and uh, his connection with the Microsoft campus here. We have a location that we are thrilled to uh, to be at, and uh, we need to at least say thank you to Michael every other time so we can remember that uh, we're here. Uh, because he invites us into this location, and this is our Microsoft connection for uh, for DNN. Um, our um, uh, sponsor for the evening is JetBrains, and uh, we have had in the past some giveaways and some different things like that from folks. I don't know if we have anything tonight from JetBrains, but we'll kind of finish with that. I believe we do. Um, but uh, they are the makers of many different tools that help you get your job done better and faster, and so... Uh, we are thankful to them for providing things and uh, for the folks that have picked up things and used them in the past. Uh, they're excited about doing so. So uh, one thing or another, whether it's uh, one set of uh, tools for Visual Studio or others, uh, you're going to find something interesting and exciting. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we give a shout out to JetBrains. Um, also, that is also another good one. Um, our good friends at PowerDNN, Manage.com, um, are also one of our uh, sponsors, and they host our website. And we need to give a good shout out to them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about their presence and participation with the community uh, at the recent DNN Con Baltimore. Um, they are a um, they are a wonderful benefit to the DNN community, and they continually get involved and help out, whether that's monetarily to support things, whether that's doing things like supporting um, our website. Uh, they're committed to the DNN community, and as uh, people of the DNN community, we have to reach back out to say thank you to them and to participate with them uh, with our business and at least give them a shot uh, to take a look at their things. Um, so I'll mention some more in, in a few minutes, but uh, whether you know them as Manage.com or PowerDNN, uh, which is staying around. Um, they are uh, uh, they are our sponsor for tonight and for our website. Um, all right, so um, the structure here tonight is that we're going to um, uh, have Nick do a presentation first. That way we don't run out of time or rush him for time. I'm going to follow after that by uh, giving kind of a, um, a run-through of DNN Con highlights. Um, we have a few general community announcements and things to, uh, to mention, and so I'll... Um, uh, pass it over to David here to mention a couple of these things, and then I'll come back up and uh, get uh, Nick started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the applause. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I was going to mention um, there's a few cool things happening in the community right now. One, uh, I don't have a whole lot of notes on it, but 8.0.2 did drop. I believe it was on the 14th. Is that right? 14th? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 
Reese. It was Reese. Reese. Oh, yeah. I was thinking, I just got 14 stuck in my brain. But anyways, it is drop and it's available. And I will mention it's also available in NV QuickSight if you don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> that's a little shameless plug there. Yeah, yeah, it'll be in the drop down. Um, and the one that I really wanted to highlight, this is something very new. Um, let me start with, it's called the solocoder.com. So Anderson Oliveira is Anderson, did I say Anderson? Oh my. <laughs> Addison, I know you're going to be watching the replay of this, so uh -huh. please do not hold that against us. Um, yeah, Addison has been doing something very cool. Um, he, he, he has a passion for uh, developers that are either just getting started out uh, doing the solo thing, or if you're in the corporate space, you know, and you just, you just feel like you want to do things on your own a little bit, or if you started out as a solo coder and now are running a company of coders and things like that, um, he's created a nice little... Uh, community, if you will, that's built on Slack. So you can come out to thesolocoder.com and you can click start, give it your email address, and he will add you to a Slack channel. For those of you that do not know what Slack is, it's a kind of like an instant messaging type platform that you can do channel kind of communications. It's a little bit like Skype, but on steroids, um, sharing files and things like that as well. But there's some great dialogue going in that community right now. Um, quite a few have joined already from Brazil and different parts of the world. And uh, we're just helping each other out. So, you know, if you have some challenges, you know, where you're doing your own thing and you're not really sure exactly how to do this thing or that thing, I mean, it's a great place, to a safe environment to just put it out there, share experiences. And one cool thing that Addison is doing in conjunction with this is he has a YouTube channel uh, here called the solo coder and by the way solo is spelled s010 not the website it is actually solo s-o-l-o but out here um, it is it, it's just kind of using the playing off the coding uh, theme here but every day he is doing a five minute or less ramble about a particular <laughs> subject that pertains to a solo coder some things you may, and just to point out a few here, he started out by talking about, um, let's see, what was it? Oh, yeah, mastermind groups, you know, and you may be familiar with that concept. And he talks a little about that, but he's he's open and welcome to hearing people either agree or disagree or offer some additional insight. It's not about Addison. It's about the community. So if you're inclined at all, please check it out. You can always leave the group if, you, if it's not for you. But I would highly recommend it. So far, it's been very helpful for me. And I'm, I'm not a solo coder per se, but that's the way I started out. So I want to try to help other other coders there as well. So that was pretty cool. That's actually all I have. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Addison, uh, Addison's well known in the community. If you're not familiar with him, uh, we'll mention him in a few minutes as well. Uh, he was uh, very involved and helpful with uh, DNN Con uh, Baltimore. Uh, some of the YouTube videos that we'll show in a little while are all uh, ones that he set up and recorded. Um, and, uh, you know, this connection with Slack and what he's doing with it um, even comes up with some of what he did uh, up in uh, DNA Baltimore. So uh, uh, he's also a good uh, member of the community. You know him from, um, let's see, um, DNN Hero and then DeskPal are his, uh, his two connection points outside of uh, Solo Coder here. Um, all right, so back over. Uh, Nick, we gave you a little bit of, uh, of uh, a time to... Uh, get ramped up, uh, psyched up for your um, presentation, right? Um, I'm going to pass over, uh, give you control so that we can see your screen, and uh, then we will uh, run from there. Yes, um, so in the chat room uh, here, we, I'm not quite able to see it, but Clint will be monitoring, so if there are any questions, uh, just put them into the chat, and then we'll bring them up to Nick um, as, as we're going through. Um, I see a few folks online. Hello to everyone that's uh, joining us online. And uh, let's uh, go ahead and swap. Call from the there we go. Nick, all, all right. yours. We'll have you on screen here in two seconds. All right. Give me a second. I'll pick my screen. And there. Is that good? All right. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to 
speak to all of you. Good evening. Yes, good evening uh, to uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Kalyani, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'll just give a very short intro. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and one of the co-founders of uh, DNN Corporation. Uh, I'm currently working on a uh, startup called WenHub, uh, along with uh, a couple of co-founders. One of them uh, is uh, Scott Adams, who you may know is the creator of uh, the Dilbert uh, comic strip. Mm -hmm. So uh, with WenHub, uh, it's my next foray after DNN uh, Corp. What we're trying to do is build a platform to aggregate every schedule in the world and create new ways in which you can visualize date and time information because fundamentally the calendar hasn't changed since it was invented and we're trying to, to change that. Um, so uh, today uh, the topic I picked was uh, machine learning, which I know is really not directly relevant to DNN, but what I try and do in w many of my talks is I try and get my um, audience to look a bit into the future. So um, trust me, every one of you is going to be working with machine learning it within the next 18 months or so. So uh, consider this your preview. Uh, here in Silicon Valley right now, if you have machine learning expertise, uh, they pretty much welcome you uh, with open arms and the highest salaries possible, etc., into into jobs. It is an extremely high demand uh, kind of uh, environment. And what I wanted to do today was to introduce you to machine learning very briefly, and then toward the end of my presentation, talk about how you might use machine learning uh, in uh, DNN. Uh, you know, we have to look past looking at DNN as just a website. It's really a container uh, to express yourself also and to create great user experiences. And those great user experiences uh, happen when you can interact uh, and, and create connections with other world's things. And that's where machine learning comes into play. So um, let's, uh, let's get going. Uh, but before we go, I just want to take one brief moment to remember Prince, um, who sadly passed away today. He's one of one of my favorite artists, and uh, uh, he, he, I used to listen to him all the time. But uh, then I had kids and couldn't listen as much because of the lyrics. But uh, I just uh, I really, really love his music. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, here is an obvious uh, picture. All of you pretty much grasped it instantly because we are humans and we have lots of intelligence. So it's an apple and an orange. As coders, I can imagine that uh, you could whip up code to, if I gave you this picture, you could whip up code to detect the apple and detect the orange in no time at all. The easiest thing would be obviously to just look at the color pixels, right? Look for red pixels and you have an apple and look for orange pixels and you have uh, an orange. Well, great, okay. Uh, I'll complicate things a little bit for you. I give you a grayscale picture. Now what do you do? Well, okay, fine, look for the shapes. Maybe the, the apple is not, not quite as circular. It has a stalk, etc. Great, you can still get this done. You don't need machine learning. Your normal code just works fine. Now, how will you your code detect the apple and the orange. So you can see how writing code to detect things like simple things like this that are, as humans we instantly saw it but really uh, for your code to do it I, I can't imagine writing code today to detect that uh, very very easily uh, with just standard code. So that's really where machine learning comes into the picture. Machine learning is very simply giving computers the ability to think without explicit programming. If you wanted to write lines and lines and lines of code, yeah, you could you could program machines to do pretty much anything. But as we all know, uh, machines, you know, computers just do what they're told. But we need thinking computers. We need computers that are able to do things intelligently. And that's where you've seen now, especially with some of the messaging services, a great increase in the number of things like bots, etc. cetera, uh, because uh, machine learning is fast becoming the way in which uh, human beings interact uh, with with uh, computers. Uh, I think uh, not very long into the future, and I'm saying like 24 months from now, 18 to 24 months from now, you will be hard pressed to find a web service, a website that you go to that does not incorporate some kind of machine learning. So this is a very um, 
uh, hot topic. So today I'm going to focus on machine learning uh, on, on Azure. Uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft has done a really good job with Azure in making machine learning more uh, accessible. Now, uh, this is the entire Azure uh, machine learning picture here, uh, and we are going to cover every one of these tonight. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. We are, we are, <laughs> we are not, not, not going to do that. But I wanted to kind of highlight for you the, uh, the difference when you talk about machine learning, what it really, really means. So first of all, you know, we are all software developers here or website designers, skinners, etc. Uh, machine learning is traditionally, uh, if you can use the word traditionally because it's really such a new topic, is typically uh, rather uh, the domain of data scientists. There's all this terminology, decision force, decision jungles, ordinal regression, descriptive stats, etc. I don't know any of this stuff because I'm not a data scientist. I'm presuming most of you aren't uh, either. But I felt very strongly that because, because uh, I'm not a data scientist, that doesn't mean that I should be locked out of this domain. Uh, I still think uh, that I would like to write software. I would like to write apps that are intelligent and can learn. And uh, that's why I started diving into this. So I'm what I would consider uh, a newbie at, at this stuff. And so what you're hearing is my fresh perspective on this. Um, I, I will probably, for a lot of questions, say, I don't know, uh, but uh, that's how we learn. You know, I mean, that's the whole point of, of, of user groups is we learn together and we share, share our knowledge. So I'm sharing my early knowledge and early, uh, uh, you know, uh, gotchas on, on this. So data scientists deal with this, the left aspect of this whole Azure map. Software developers, we deal with the right aspect of this. So if you can see, uh, it's probably not very legible up there, but things like Azure Blob Storage, Azure Table, OData Feed, uh, Web URLs, etc. So that's terminology we are more familiar with. We we have encountered that as we work with with websites and web applications. So what Azure has done is through uh, an application called the Azure Machine Learning Studio, it's essentially bridged the gap. It allows data scientists and software developers to work together. So data scientists don't know anything about the data aspect of it, like uh, the, the services, the, the, uh, how, how to manipulate with code things, whereas software developers tend to know very little about the statistical aspects of it, the data science aspects of it. What Azure Machine Learning Studio does, as you will see here today, is make it all super simple so that we can kind of bridge that gap uh, very, very uh, easily. So all of it is accessible at studio.azuremachinelearning.net and uh, uh, because uh, they are just introducing this, they, they have a, uh, an eight hours of processing time uh, for free. So you can just go in there and have no credit card, uh, just sign up and, and start using this right away so you can get a feel for how things, things work. Uh, on my slide here, what you're seeing is these six boxes basically uh, the the gist of machine learning in using it on this uh, Azure Studio comes down to this. So you start by importing some data. Uh, the way the Studio works is it's got to work on some kind of data. So you might have your data today in, in a SQL database. You might have it in an Excel spreadsheet. You might have it in a text file that's comma separated values. You might have it accessible on a web service. Um, the the Azure machine um, uh, learning Studio accepts all of it. It can work with just about any kind of data that you can uh, throw throw at it. Then what you want to do is you want to pre-process the data, and it has the tools to do that too. By pre-process, I mean things like, you know, you want to delete duplicate rows, you want to uh, remove bad data, etc. So there's there's tools for that also, and we'll see some of that. And then comes a very important step: you split the data. So one part of machine learning is something called training. So what you do as part of machine learning is, is teach the computer what your data is about. So when you split data, what you're doing is saying, I'm going to partition my data. Typically, it's like a 70-30 split or a 75-25% split. But you say, I'm going to use 75% of my data to train uh, as a training model. And the remaining 25% I will use to ensure that uh, think of it as test data for the model that's been learned so that you can validate that it actually works. Because if all the data is used for training, then there's no data left over for scoring and for e evaluating 
if uh, uh, things are working correctly. And so that's what split data comes. Then uh, the built-in machine learning algorithms, that's where the real value of the Azure uh, platform comes into play. What they have done is they have essentially abstracted all of the common data science machine learning algorithms into very simple uh, select selectors that you can just use and say, I want to plug this in. So you don't have to go, imagine doing this in C sharp code or whatever, you would be going around looking for the appropriate uh, libraries via NuGet or whatever and then writing code and testing, debugging, none of that. It makes it super simple to do that. So your data that's split, the machine learning algorithm, they work and they create this trained model. So at this point, uh, Azure uh, will have learned what your data is about and will have developed the appropriate statistical models. At that point, it goes into a scoring model and that scoring model is what is used in order to, for you to get results. So this is very high level. As we get into it, some of these things will become more familiar. But first, before we, we go into how the solutions work, let's understand what, what the classes of different problems are that you can solve. So primarily, there are five types of problems that you can be solving with machine learning. The first one is the most common one, which is given a huge set of data, assign a category to each item. So maybe you've got a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, restaurant menus and you want to classify them according to what type of uh, restaurant it is. That's just a, a, a random example, but as we get uh, toward the end, I'll give you some specific DNN type examples. Then there is a regression which is really about being able to, based on past behavior or past data sets, predict what's going to happen uh, uh, next, predict a real value. So in classifying, you're taking things and saying, well, it goes into this bucket. With regression, you're coming up with, this is what I predict is going to be the number, the temperature, the weather, all of that kind of stuff. Ranking, this is actually something that we encounter almost every day at, when we do a Google or a Bing search, the result page. It's ranked certainly by lots of different signals such as page rank, etc. But most importantly, if you're logged in, those rankings are always customized to you. They are relevant to you. And that's because it's gone through a machine learning algorithm to decide which of those uh, search results are most relevant to you. So ordering items according to some criteria is, uh, uh, how, uh, is, is a, uh, one class of learning problem. The next one is, is clustering. So this is typically sometimes called sentiment analysis also where you take a, a big set of data and you want to say, well, I, I want to know in real time if all the reports about my company are positive, about my company's product release are positive or negative. Well, you cannot expect humans to, to do that in, in, in a real-time fashion and get good results, but machines can do it. They can cluster those results and say, well, here's all these results that are, have a positive uh, sentiment for your product, and here's ones that are negative, and maybe you can then uh, focus your energy on, on uh, addressing why they're negative uh, and while promoting the ones that are positive. So that's kind of the clustering is there. And the, the last one is uh, really uh, the one I started off with is the apple and the orange. It's a dimensional, dimensionality reduction uh, kind of problem. What you do there is you train uh, the algorithm with lots of data about what's an apple, what's an orange, and based on uh, its learning, it is able to then reduce the data set into probabilities uh, so uh, you can easily then detect uh, whether it's an apple or an orange. We are not at the point yet where it's 100% certainty, but you, as, your, as the algorithms get better and as they get more data, they get better and, and better. So that's a dimensionality redu reduction kind of problem. Today we are going to focus on the simplest one classification because really my goal for tonight is not to really try and cover everything about machine learning. My goal is to show you how easy it is for you to get your feet wet and just dive into it because I know it seems like a difficult, complex topic that you want to keep, like, like it's not for me to deal with right now. Uh, but I'm telling you that after tonight you will feel that it is something that you can dive into pretty easily if you ignore a lot of the stuff. Because a lot of the stuff is data science related. You don't have to necessarily mess with it, but you can certainly do some things and, and find utility from it. So uh, when it comes to uh, usage, uh, I shop on Amazon a lot, I'm sure a lot of others do, and you get this recommendation. So 
machine learning is behind this. So, you know, I, it gets some things right, it gets some things uh, wrong. Obviously, I, I've uh, uh, been buying some books for my kids, I got some parts for my drone. Uh, let's see, what uh, it got mostly, mostly uh, things, uh, things right. Uh, I don't know too much about the mystery, thriller, and suspense books. I might have bought one a long time ago. Um, but it mostly gets it right. So this is a, a real example of a website using it. Now imagine this on your website where you have recommendations for content for your users based on things they have read before. Uh, can you do that today? Well, yeah, you could keep track of a score, like every time they've clicked on something and then do some average or mean or something like that and, 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 and get it to work. But that's not quite intelligent. All that is doing is, is, is using numbers to kind of um, uh, guess. And I think this, we can do much better than that. And that's what uh, uh, tonight's about. So uh, you, you will wonder, once you get into the machine learning studio, what do I do? So you can see here, I have a slide that has a lot of confusing things up here. But uh, worry not. Uh, basically, what this chart is trying to do is tell you for the type of problem you have, what kind of machine learning algorithm to use. Um, it will be some time before we are all familiar with everything, and, and really, in a lot of cases, I don't expect to be familiar with all of it because it's, again, data science. But if you pay attention to the box on the bottom right, the one that says two class classification, that's a common one. And you'll be using this more than anything else, and that's the focus of tonight. Specifically, I'm going to use, and this is a mouthful, a two class boosted decision tree. So I have no idea how that term originates, but it does speak to the classes. So when you, ha when you have a two-class classification, what you're doing is a binary kind of classification. A, a good example of that is, is this user who's trying to register on my DNN website a spam user or a real user? So that, that, you could do that in real time and maybe put them into a bucket where they don't get approved right away because, and I know that's been a problem previously, et cetera. Uh, email, uh, is, should this content be posted? Is it offensive to my community in my forum? Uh, you can make that decision on the fly using uh, a two-class system and, and um, uh, go, go, uh, move forward. So now what I'm going to do is, um, before I move forward, are there any, any questions? Uh, Clint, okay. anything from Clint, anything from online? Uh, Grant? Yeah, uh, when you get into the machine learning, I think uh, you also get into that risk of what if your machine goes wild? So is the first thing like a kill switch? <laughs> So, I'm not sure if you could hear Grant, and he was saying, uh, the more you teach the machines, uh, the more you have to worry about them going wild or doing what you didn't expect. So uh, where do you pull the plug on these when they go crazy? Yeah, well, um, uh, it's a really, really good question. So um, I think we have to just accept the fact that at some point we're going to be ruled by our machine overlords and just <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, 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 I guess as we get into advanced robotics, those are those are are questions that the ethicists among us are going to have to figure out is is what does it mean? I mean, you've probably seen a video of uh, that guy kicking the robot repeatedly and the robot keeps falling down and uh, no wonder that they take over and and, uh, and enslave us uh, because, uh, you know, those are some of the things uh, that we don't know the answers to today. Yeah. But in this case, it's very simplistic. You turn off the service, you know, that you're going to see here. Uh, all right, so let me switch over now to my um, Azure Studio. Let's see. Is this, is this what a lot of these social media platforms are using to measure sentiment and things like that? I mean, are they real time essentially just aggregating all this data? And yeah, Nick, I'm not sure how much volume you can hear out of that, but um, David was asking that since you did mention sentiment, um, do you know if this is what a lot of the, the social networks are now using to judge sentiment of content? Or are they doing things like this? Uh, so we, I, I don't believe there's uh, a full-fledged, uh, fully automated machine learning being used everywhere, but I think what it is being used at is a primary filter before it goes to humans, uh, and I think I think that's going to improve to the point where it becomes fully uh, fully automated. Uh, you can you can see hints of that when 
uh, you know, you upload a YouTube video and you use some copyrighted music in the background, it, it's, it's scanned, then determining uh, is that copyrighted or not, that's a pretty straightforward binary thing. But then if your video also contains images, that's harder to do because you can't just uh, you, you can't have a, a, a fingerprint for just that video, right? So that requires some machine learning to look for specific images and compare them to others that exist and say, ah, this is a copyrighted video that you have included in, embedded in your video, etc. Mm -hmm. So, So the short answer is the trend is it's going more and more towards using machine learning for that kind of thing. Um, All right. Uh, so, Nick, while, while you were preparing and pulling this up, I've got two more questions from uh, online and in the house. Um, online was asking uh, that you mentioned earlier that this uh, Azure ML.net right now is doing free so that you get eight hours of running and testing and, and jumping into it. Uh, but someone else mentioned that you, if you already have a subscription and you already have a, um, a plan going, is this already included in this? Is this something special that's yeah. external? No, it's 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 included in there, and uh, the pricing, etc., is all conformant to the usual Azure thing. Uh, so even if you have an existing Azure subscription, you can still add your eight hours of experimentation um, uh, in there. So the answer is yes. Um, okay, but, so, so uh, is ML included in the Azure subscriptions, so that it's uh, you know it's already there if you if you already have a paid set of subscriptions. Uh, y yes, but again, it is like all Azure services, a paid service, so you will have to pay for it. It's not yeah. free. But if you use that eight-hour chunk, that part is free. Yes. So, well, one more uh, in house. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See that, that logic of the, uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, Nick, um, to um, pair to the, the question was that, uh, you know, seeing things inside of Netflix and Amazon Video and things like that, that once you see uh, selections that have been made before, that it starts to give you better and better recommendations on other things you might like, more than just related actors or titles, but actually getting into more the bigger data about them and giving you better and better selections the more you participate or the more data it has about you. That's that's generally the idea of what we're talking about, right? Precise, precisely. That is machine learning. I mean, you can do personalization using, uh, uh, you know, standard algorithms, but with machine learning, you can get much better results. And uh, they, the, the, you know, as humans, we think we are, we are all unique, and we are, but our behavior tends to be very repeat, repeated by people who, who are uh, similar to us. And so that inference of, you know, once you have more data, you can make those inferences and, and use those uh, uh, to, to make better user experiences. So, yeah. Okay, so at this point, you should be seeing uh, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning. Is that the screen I'm showing? Right, we great. Do. All right. Yes. So, um, I, in order to shortcut the process, I went ahead and signed up, and you can see here it says Nick Kalyani free workspace. I'm using the free workspace, the, the free eight-hour kind of thing, and I've come um, to experiments. Projects is just a way to group a bunch of experiments together. So, we are going to do experiments um, and uh, figure out uh, what, uh, what happens there. So, uh, one of the challenges with doing this kind of demo is you need large data sets, and I didn't have, so I'm going to use the, the, the existing sample data that is there on Azure, which also makes it easy for you to repeat what I'm doing uh, uh, okay. on, your own, on your own device. So we're going to start off with creating a, a new um, experiment, experiment, and uh, I did that by clicking the plus on the bottom, and it gives me a, a bunch of different choices. I'm going to choose a blank uh, experiment. So as I do that, <coughs> uh, it should kick in, and it tells me that uh, uh, I can start uh, creating by dragging some items here. So you'll find here in, in uh, that Azure uh, machine learning is actually very, very simple. There's, uh, it, it's mostly drag and drop. So you can see here that there's a bunch of different categories. Uh, and oh, one thing I didn't, want, I, I didn't point out earlier is uh, if you're a data scientist, uh, typically, or even if you're working in the domain of machine learning, you would be using Python or R code. But the beauty of using 
Microsoft Azure Machine Learning is that uh, you can use the familiar languages. Uh, so all of these tools are available in different forms with a Amazon, with Google, etc. I chose this because it's the domain we are we are in is the Microsoft uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem. So all right, so let's uh, look for some uh, sample uh, data. And what the one of the sample data sets here is uh, adult uh, census uh, data. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, and uh, drag that over here and. Uh, uh, what this does is start off my experiment with this uh, particular uh, data set. Now, you notice that when I dragged it on here, a few things happened is on the bottom I got, I got some you know, usual save, etc. But one important thing is, is run. So as you build your experiment, you will want to run it just like as we build our code in our app. We do a build and run it and see. It might just say, hello world but we still want to see it. So this is a similar kind of user development experience. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and run this. And uh, it says the, uh, this experiment contains no modules. Well, I expected that a little bit because of the fact that right now I have some data, but I've told it, I've told it nothing in terms of what I want it to do with the, the data. So what I'm going to do now, uh, and I'm using the search thing here because it's a bit quicker than navigating uh, all the different uh, uh, categories that are there. So, um, but in this case, uh, you can see here that there are uh, data format conversions. So you have lots of ways to manipulate data. This uh, data uh, you can uh, use readers, writers, enter data manually, etc. But what we are going to do is we are going to split our data. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier that part of that splitting is to have some data for training our model and the rest for testing our model. So let's go ahead and, and split our data now. And the beauty of uh, this studio is that you drag these things and you make them work by, by simply connecting them with drag and drop. So it makes it super, super simple. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a lag now on my screen because of GoToMeeting, so I apologize if, I, 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 if I'm pausing uh, at weird times. Uh, no, so, you're good. You're good. All right. So, Does anyone else so remember now, Yahoo Pipes? This is very much like Yahoo Pipes as far as the structure is concerned. Yeah, absolutely. In, 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 it's, it's a common way to have a UI for showing a sequence of, of things happening and data flowing. So uh, when I click on split data here over in my properties, it asks me, well, how do, you, how do I want to split? And I'm going to say I want it to be uh, 70, 30. So is that 70%? And I want to randomize it. So what I could do is I could make it where it just splits it by counting the top 70%, and uh, but I wanted to randomly pick a few, and uh, I'll just give it uh, uh, a random seed there. So there are lots of terms as you go through it that you will see lots of fields that I'm going to ignore for two reasons. One, I have no idea what they are, and and two, I have a short amount of time to present this. So. Uh, uh, like I said earlier, you know, I'm a newbie at this too. I'm just trying to share what I've learned so far, and hopefully, uh, as as we all learn about this, we can help each other grow. So at this point, I do have uh, some portion of my model. Let's see if I can uh, run it now. So it appears to be doing something. So that's that's good. So what it's doing at this point is I've given it a data set, and I've told it to to split. And so it's uh, done with, with that. And so now, uh, if I right click here, I can visualize my data. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll see what the data is that has been uh, imported. So you can see here that uh, this is census data. This is standard. Uh, all these field names, et cetera, are standard. They come from the US uh, government census. Uh, for example, uh, the working class, etc. These are not arbitrary. These are very specific labels. Financial weight is uh, uh, a statistical number that is assigned to people via that census. So these are all fairly self-explanatory uh, here. But uh, uh, some of the 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 key one that we care about is this one called income. What we are going to do in this in this uh, experiment is we are going to create a machine learning uh, algorithm that based on the input of all these criteria will determine if your income is greater than 50K or less than or equal to 50K. That's the, the, the result of this. So you can extrapolate that 
and change that and say, uh, based on this criteria, maybe this is instead of this database, this is your user registered database, and you can ex extrapolate and figure out, will this user respond to my newsletter? Uh, or will this person buy or things like that? So you can, so remember, we, we uh, remember that long-term two-class boosted decision tree? So that's where the two classes, it's income is greater than 50K or less than 50K. That's the point of, of, of uh, this year. So now that we've run through, uh, uh, it's, it's, it has obtained 22,793 rows. Um, and if you go look in, uh, in uh, here, Visualize. That we see that there's 9,768. So these are randomly selected. They were split based on the fact that I told it to randomly split into 70%. Uh, All right. So now that we have that done, it's time to uh, uh, train to to introduce the the, uh, the 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 training aspects of this. So for that, I'm going to look for a train model. So I'm going to drag that in here. And now what we do is uh, right off the bat when you drag something in there, it will tell you that something is, is missing and you need to do something uh, with it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and connect my 70% data to this uh, model here. And now over here, you've, you, it's, it's expecting me to tell it which column uh, I am uh, training on. So let's go ahead and select that. And what we want to do is we want to select income, which is right there. So we'll select that and we'll go ahead and check. So now that that's done, uh, now it's still uh, got uh, a problem. The problem is that the input port for what kind of algorithm to use is, is missing. So the algorithm we want to use is the two-class boosted decision tree. So let's look for that. So two-class. So you can see here there's a bunch of two-class um, uh, two class algorithms. We're going to use this one, two-class boosted. And remember I was telling you earlier that there is essentially encapsulated some very complex algorithms into these drag boxes. So it becomes, without knowing necessary, if you know that you need a two-class neural network but you don't care to know how it works, this is brilliant because you just use it and get it going. So now that we've introduced this, we want to go ahead and wire it up to our model here. So uh, we now have uh, some, uh, we've got the data, we've split it, we've got the training model, we have told it what algorithm to use, and so now uh, our model can can effectively be, be trained. So let's uh, run this. I don't expect there to be any new data at, at this point, but I like to run it just to make sure that it doesn't uh, highlight any, any problems. So one of the challenges with machine learning is the amount of time to train. It's not unusual if you have like millions of documents for the learning part to take, you know, hours or days uh, even. In this case, with just 32,000 rows, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. So uh, we have a train model now, and what I would like to do is visualize what that model is. So let's go in here, and we'll see that this is the part where, although we have uh, no, like, tangible data, I wanted you to see what is happening when this training is occurring. What uh, the algorithm is doing is creating decision trees, and these decision trees are essentially for every item that's in there, they are creating uh, trees that, that implement the statistical uh, model. Imagine doing this in code. This is not a fun endeavor for us to do every time we wanted to implement some machine learning, but thankfully this is all uh, done for us. Why are there 100 trees? Because somewhere up there is a default setting of 100 trees. As you get more sophisticated in learning, you, you, you might change the number of trees that it, it trains with, uh, etc. But you can see here that what's happening is that it's looking at each value and then based upon that value arriving at ultimately the exact uh, one of two things. It's either greater than 50k or less than or equal to 50k because that's our, our the purpose of our 
our uh, experiment here. We are trying to create uh, an intelligent model that will predict that. So we're done with uh, uh, that part. Uh, I just wanted to show that it's not necessary for you to ever actually look at that. It's kind of like a under the hood kind of thing. Uh, so now uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to score this model. So the trees have been created, but ultimately in order to process the data and do something meaningful with it, you have to come up with a numerical score. And that's what the score model does. So go ahead and get the scoring model in here. All right. And you can see here that the scoring model has two data input ports. So you can probably guess what's, what, why it has two. The, the first one is for our train data. So we wire that up or not. Okay, there we go. Just didn't drag it enough. And the second one is our straight through, our, our raw data. Now that we have a trained model, we are going to uh, pass it directly here so that it can be scored against that trained model. So let's do that. Okay. This go to meeting is messing with my dragging skills here. Come on. There you go. All right. So at this point, let's go ahead and run our code again. Uh, our rather, I keep saying code. I meant to say experiment. So used to saying code. Uh, and uh, you will see the processing happening where it's basically all the steps that haven't been completed are being completed. Green check is good. Things are going well. Still running up here on the top right. 13, 14. All right, we are done. Now this is where we see the impact of the scoring model. We can go into visualize. And by the way, as it's doing that, you can see here there's a bunch of nice sample data you can play with. Uh, uh, there's also some like movie titles and things like that. So if you want to make a little app that uh, predicts which movies you would like based on movies you liked before, etc. Yeah. All right. So here's our table again. Uh, not much difference, huh? But wait. Let's scroll over to the right and look what, what we have here. We now have scored labels and scored probabilities. So for every one of these, it has created a, a score, and that score is what determines uh, the confidence level. So it, it tells you what is the probability of, of this result. Um, and uh, you'll see in the next slide here, I'm going to uh, sh 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 next screen here about how that, that factors in. But essentially, this is the step where we've taken all the work that we've done until this point, which is uh, train the model um, and get the data, split the data, uh, etc. And we've actually got to the point where we've got a number here. So now the next step is uh, to continue to build an experiment. And it's really the, 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 the last step in creating this part of the experiment. And that part, part is we need to evaluate. So I'm going to search for evaluate here. We're going to evaluate our model. So I realized that just about all this terminology is probably uh, uh, new and, and alien, but it was to me also, and I'm gradually becoming familiar uh, with it. But if you play around with this long enough, um, uh, it, you can see there's a, a, a structure to it. All right, there we go, it's connected. Okay, so let's run. So to, to this point, uh, we have taken data and created a scoring model and scored it without writing a single line of code. Uh, we'll, we'll look at what code would be involved here in, uh, a little later. So let's look at our data set here. And this is the main thrust of what you're trying to do. So this here is a, a statistical curve. And um, I had a math minor, but wasn't that good at stats. So I'm going to try and explain this as best as I can. If you're a statistician, uh, please don't laugh at me. Um, okay, 
So this curve here uh, uh, is really, if the way to interpret that is to look at this here. It says true positive rate and false positive rate. As the model is being uh, uh, enumerated, it, what it's doing is it's trying to figure out if the guess it made, so let's say that it guessed greater than 50K, is that, was that correct or was that wrong? And so that's uh, what this is about. This here is called a curve and what you, you'll hear, you'll see a term called AUC. It's called area under curve. Uh, in order to explain that a bit better, I'm going to switch to um, another slide here, back to my presentation. So let's look at uh, that. So am, are you seeing my, my presentation slide yes. now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, this this data you're seeing there is almost identical to what uh, uh, I had on the previous screen on the left. The part on the right is what I want you to focus on. So in this graph here, what you're seeing is what happens with classification. So you have something called true positives. Those are the ones that should have been greater than 50K that the, the algorithm did detect to be greater than 50K. So that's what true positive means. A false positive um, is where it was supposed to be less than or equal to 50K, but it found it to be uh, greater than 50K. Uh, in Over here, the false negatives are the ones that are essentially wrong. It was supposed to be greater than 50K, but they were marked as less than 50K. And then there's true negatives, which are less than or equal to 50K, uh, which were actually marked as 50K. So, so the good ones are the true positives and the true negatives. So uh, what is a positive and a negative? Remember, we, have, we are classifying with, with two classes, right? So if you look on the bottom here, it, it, positive or negative is not positive or negative in the, in the traditional sense. It's just saying that arbitra yeah, arbitrarily, this one is the positive one, and arbitrarily, this one is the negative one. Depending on the order, it could have been flipped. You can flip it uh, if, you, if you want to. So um, that's what, in a two-class algorithm, positive and negative are, are the two values that you're, you're dealing with. So some other terms that you will encounter are, are precision and, and recall. So precision tells you how many of the selected items are, are relevant, and uh, uh, recall is the opposite, uh, well, not the opposite, the inverse, how many relevant items were, were uh, selected. So all of this uh, is really in the domain of data science, so I didn't spend too much time working with it, but let me switch back here and show you why this is kind of important. So look here, looking here, you see a, a line here that goes here. Uh, that line is the threshold line. Um, in a lot of machine learning systems, you get, uh, for two-class uh, two class kind of algorithms, you get uh, a binary result, yes or no. But in other systems, you get a result that is a, an actual number. And what you have to decide, uh, if you think about probabilities, right, the probability is 0 to 1. So that number represents the probability from 0 to 1. And what you have to decide is, do you want to use this straight line as the threshold, um, or do you want to use something something else? So you can you can change these values, and you can see that if you if you make the threshold 0 0.116, what happens is your true positives go up, your false negatives uh, go, go go down, but at the same time your true negative uh, false positives also went went way up. Yep. So Part of data science is that it's not absolute. There is no absolute. It's about tweaking the model to get the results at a confidence level that matches the requirement you have. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, maybe this is about uh, denying some, uh, you know, accepting uh, acceptance for loan or not, you want to be a bit careful about that because you're dealing with people's lives there. But well, if, if it's like show a sticker on their website or not, well, you know what, you can get away with, with false negatives, you don't really care. So <clears> the degree of, of, uh, of what you're doing, you know, the importance will determine how you, mess, uh, how you, how you work with, with the model. Yeah. I'm gonna bring this you're, basically, to you're basically setting your tolerance for what's worse for you to accept, false positives Correct. or false negatives, and you're, you're choosing which tolerance you have. Exactly. 
you are exactly right about that. All right, so we've got all of this done now, but so far we've just played around in uh, uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio. We really need to connect this with the outside world so we can make things happen with our with the stuff we know, which is websites and web services. So uh, okay. thankfully for us, uh, Azure has done a great job of of uh, uh, of integrating that really well. And so let's go into that area now. So I just uh, hit save so I can make sure it's all saved. All right. So the next thing we do is um, we we uh, oh. I have to run it one more time here. Uh, every time you make a change, uh, you have to rerun uh, so that it, it re-registers the changes. I, ch I messed around with the threshold slider, and so that was a change, and so I had to rerun it. Um, so now that I've done that, I can click here, and this previous option that was not available is now available, and that is predictive web service. So let's go ahead and, and select that. What we are going to do is we are going to make our trained model accessible from a standard web service that we can call with an API. Okay. So did I select that? <clears throat> Come on. Is it doing it? Oh, there you go. Wasn't registering my click. All right. So now what has happened here is that if you look on the top, our training experiment, uh, there's two tabs now. Before there were no tabs. And what it's done is it has taken our experiment, uh, our data, and our scoring model and put them into a predictive experiment. Um, so here's our data. Here's the experiment that we created, the scoring model. And we have a really nice uh, web service input and a web service uh, output. So what we do want to do here at this point is we want to, uh, let's see, where is it? I'm looking for, I'm looking for an option that I don't know the first letter of it. Uh, yeah, let's search for it. Bear with me one second. I gotta figure this out here. What I need to do is essentially filter out the income uh, from the the input uh, because uh, that's what we are trying to detect. So, sorry about that. There it is. Project columns. That's what I was looking. At. Project the columns. Okay. So. I, what I did was I dragged this project columns on here, and what I'm going to do is essentially <coughs> rewire the uh, uh, the income data to a column projection here. Okay. And then I'm going to wire this back to there. So let's see why we have to do that. Let's go into our column selector here and say uh, we want to select all columns other than income. That's uh, for our input. So we go with rules, we say all columns, uh, and we say include, exclude mm -hmm. income. So now we've, we've said take that whole data, but for our web service input, we are not going to receive um, an income. And that's that. And uh, for our web service output, we don't necessarily have to do anything, but I want to make it a bit efficient. So what I'm going to do is have it spit out, uh, instead of all the columns, just spit out the score and the probability of that score. Because really, uh, you don't need to know all the data that you already sent to the web service input. You, you would have all the age and all that already on whatever client you have. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to go here and say, we wire the scoring model up, oops, wrong one. We wire the scoring model to our project columns, and then we wire this back to here. And now we go and tell this that we want to only include 
two columns, scored labels and scored probabilities. So that scored labels is the greater than 50K, less than or equal to 50K, et cetera. All right, and let's run this. It's gonna validate everything for us. So what we did was we created an experiment, we created a model, we trained the model, we tested it, uh, it seemed to work, and now we are wiring it up for use by the outside world. So everything there seems to be okay. All right, so it is time for us now that we have the web service created to deploy the web service, and this is the easiest part. So what it's gonna do now is give us a token that we can use in our standard web service API calls so that we can test out the, the, the service. So here's the API uh, key, and um, we can, in fact, uh, test it out right here within uh, the, the Azure environment, but to, to show you that it actually, so it, it gives you a little helper dialog and you can try it out, but it's more fun to actually call it from a JSON client. So I'm gonna click here on request response and go to Good idea of this help, yeah. help page, and it tells me here's the URL, so I'll grab this URL. So all this is, is is the specific URL for the web service I've just created. So I'll copy that and I'm gonna go over here to my friend Postman and uh, let's... Uh, That's what uh, Tony used, I was wondering about that. Uh, sorry, we're, we're chatting internal uh, here. Um, I was wondering what you were gonna use to test the uh, web service API and you pulled up Postman, which is the same tool that uh, Tony introduced us to um, uh, an issue or another episode ago um, yeah. uh, when he was doing uh, token uh, tokens and uh, running through the same things. Yeah, I use Postman most of the time. I, I'm working on a Mac uh, right now, and so there's an incredibly awesome app that's like 100 times better than Postman. It's called Pause. I use that quite a bit uh, also. Uh, but Postman is, is really good. Uh, all right, so here's our thing. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's configure our, our service. Uh, headers, I have a couple of presets here. I have a JSON preset that gives a content type and an accept type. Uh, we need to add an authorization header. Uh, you know what, I just realized this is probably not legible to most of you there, so let me, oops, that was too much. Uh -huh. uh, let's see if I can zoom this up uh, a bit more. Uh, Postman doesn't want to zoom. Um, well, you just have to take my word for it, I'm sorry. Uh, See, is there, see it. They can? Okay, all right. So authorization, and uh, you will stumble on this if you uh, get it wrong, so please uh, just note the fact that authorization uh, values are always bearer, and, and this is true not only for Azure, but if you do any Google OAuth or anything like that, this is very tricky. It has to be bearer followed by a space, followed by your key. So I'm gonna go get my key now go back here. So it's always in this format. So going back this way, so it's it's uh, bearer space that. All right, so we've got we've got uh, our headers. Uh, we've got, uh, now we have to provide the input. So I'm gonna say it's raw. And in order to save us typing time, I have created a request already, which I will review before I send. Um, so this is just straight up JSON, nothing nothing uh, uh, out of the ordinary here. So uh, where did I get this from? Well, it's right here. Um, they give you the sample, so it's it's easy for you to copy paste it. Uh, I've already done, done some of that. So there's column names and then there's values. So I put, for age, I put 40, working class, private, uh, the financial weight, I put 100,000, bachelor's degree, which corresponds to the number 13 for the education number, marital star status is uh, ma married, civilian spouse, uh, executive slash managerial, husband, white male, uh, no capital uh, gains, no capital losses, 40 year old, United States. All right, so we did all that and uh, let's see if this works and it is, the request is unauthorized. All right, so let's see why. 
Uh, did I mess up the credentials? Uh, he's uh, David is eagle eye over here. He says in the API key yeah. you put the wrong. I put the URL. Yep. Yes, I didn't copy it correctly. Well, you know, it's it's always good to have something fail in in uh, a demo. Uh, Absolutely. So you know that it's not canned. It's not canned. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, where did I go? I think I got it this time. Yes. Okay. Let's try it. And we have a number. So it says that the probability this is most likely a greater than 50k person, and that's the score value that that came came about as a result of that. So uh, what you've seen here is is, is essentially end to end, starting with uh, the the data set. We we modeled it and we ended up with a web service. So from here, it's no different than using any other web service in in DNN, whether you know whether it's a standard Google one or or, or whatever. So it's it's very very straightforward and and uh, uh, simple to 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 do that. Uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, and we'll come back to this if there are questions. But I wanted to share with you one last slide here, which is uh, I wanted to kind of give you some ideas for how to use uh, machine uh, learning with DNN and. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I am still learning some of this myself. Uh, perhaps, if you if you are interested, I would love to come back in the future and actually have a a content module where it does machine learning and incorporates that in there because it's really impossible to do that in the span of one session uh, here. We, I would need two two to three sessions to do that. But some of the ideas I had is spam registration detection sort articles by relevance to the user so you keep if you have data about uh, about your users and what what different users are viewing uh, even if it's a brand new user and you have no history on them because of machine learning you can suggest relevant articles uh, to them uh, if you are running e-commerce then uh, the Amazon way it's recommended products in in in, in the store um, here's one thing that I think would be very interesting is to make using the the using the capabilities of the, the platform uh, to show hide pages based on security, why not show hide pages based on machine learning algorithms? So you filter out stuff that users would not care about. Why does it always have to be the whole site? Why can't the site just show me dynamically a navigation that is customized for me without a programmer having had to write code to do that? Um, also to create dynamic or virtual groups based on interest topics. It just kind of happens where you get you end up in, in a group based on what you have done before. Uh, predict which users will respond to a newsletter. So, you know, when once you enter the domain of content, this list could be infinite. It really is based upon what is the data you have. All of us have with the DNN portal the basic user registration, you know, database. So that is a good jumping off point to use. But if you're in a specific domain, your website is about widgets, then you might have some other widgets data that could be used to, to um, influence what users see. So that uh, it, it was my presentation for, for this evening. I wanted to walk through uh, a very simple machine learning exercise. I know I touched upon some complex topics, but hopefully you can see how, how easily you can, with the right data set, uh, call back into the machine learning uh, Azure uh, engine and get get uh, results right away. I'm happy to switch back to the studio now and, and take any questions uh, anyone anyone has and hopefully this 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 session was was useful for you and you learn learn something from it. We already have a good few questions coming in. Um, one of them that just came in from online was, uh, how do you choose the algorithms? How do you choose the algorithm sets that you're going to um, to work with? Yeah, so that's, uh, uh, let me go back in my presentation here. Um, I uh, That was an earlier slide I had. Let's see, where is it? Let's write that one there. So. Uh, this particular slide, and I put I put the URL at the top, so you can hit that URL and, and get to it. Uh, I should probably uh, put it into the chat there also. But I'll, I'll share this deck with you so you, you have it. But this here tries to give you, uh, on the right-hand side, 
a plain English of what it is you're trying to do, and on the left-hand side, what algorithm to use. And uh, again, I'll confess that there are plenty of resources out there that can do a better job of explaining that than I have, because I'm not a data scientist. But what I've found is that uh, some of these are designed for fairly complex use cases that you probably will not be doing right off the bat. But this is a good slide for, for answering that question. Um, Clint, do we have more questions uh, from online? Well, what was doing the split? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was kind of an earlier question. Um, when you were watching the split action occur, the 70-30 split, what was doing the crunch behind that split? Was that Azure actually doing the brain works there? Yeah, everything is entirely Azure here. There was not a line of code that I wrote and introduced here, although it does support that. It supports the ability for you to use your R or Python script and inject it in there to do specific things. But that split was entirely driven by the choice I made to, uh, of the percentage and I checked the box that said random, and that's it. Otherwise, it would have done a sequential block and just uh, uh, chosen that. So, um, yeah. Wrong uh, another question in house we got? Yeah, but so Nick, were you able to hear much of that? I'll relay. Yeah, yeah please relay. So um, the data that you started from, um, your adult census data, that was a fixed set of, set of data that you connected into this model. If you have your own data that you're working from, do you have to keep bringing in that fixed set of data as of this point, as of two weeks from now, as of three weeks from now? Is there any way to connect this up to live data that's, that's constantly refreshed or, or being live, or does it have to work off of... Uh, a snapshot or a fixed set of data? That, that's an excellent question and it highlights the difference between machine learning and what we are used to. So what we are used to is doing an analysis of a data set and then based upon that processing and, and getting a result and perhaps even caching that result so we can use it and then maybe you know uh, re refreshing the cache. So with machine learning the whole thing is this is learning. Uh, so what you're given it is is a large enough data set where it can learn and be smart, but it doesn't mean that it's 100% accurate. So that process of, re, of, of giving a new data is called retraining, and it, it is simply a matter of you rerunning that periodically. I don't know that it would be something uh, that would necessarily be set up to be real time, because you know here it was quick, but if, if the training process takes two days, you don't want to. You don't want to have it run all the time. You want it to be a very carefully controlled thing. So, so the answer is, it is possible to retrain, and in fact, you should. But uh, it would be a, a synchronous process that you do uh, when, when, when the the situation yeah. demands it. Um. Well, uh, we have any more questions from online or uh, in the in the house? David, did you have a question from earlier? Same question. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, data was one of my questions as well, uh, was uh, that it seems like having good quality data to start from, that you already know the answer that you are looking to find is one of the key things that you have to start from. And if you don't have that, you've got to find that to begin with. Yeah, and, and part of the, the uh, these tools, what they do is help you clean up some of that data. So if it's messy, if it has bad values, you can tell it, ignore ignore rows with, uh, you know, missing values. You can tell it uh, to keep them or you can, those are all choices that you have uh, in here. So based upon your specific requirements, uh, yeah, you can, you can have even a bad data set and then have it learn by transforming that into a mediocre better. Yeah. or better data set. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Grant, you had uh, one last question? Yeah, I was wondering, does he see these tools being migrated down to a product like SQL Server? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, Grant says, if this is all about data and crunching data, do, do you see a future of this getting this more 
solidly integrated into what we already do with data. So do you see this becoming a feature of SQL Server and having a simple checkbox to validate data you know, down the road? Probably way into the future. Let me tell you why it's not going to be ha happening in the near future. It's simply a matter of processing time. So the, w w when you have large data sets, millions of rows or billions of rows, etc., you don't want to have that done on your server because, well, you'll need to have some pretty beefy servers and that's what the cloud is for. So Azure scales up as needed, gets the resources it needs and then uh, turns them down. So uh, I, I, I fully expect that there will be subsets of this uh, that will be integrated uh, into uh, you know SQL Server, etc. But altogether, the, the whole point of machine learning is is to take advantage of the massive scale of, of cloud machines to do things quickly, analyze things quickly, and in near real time make decisions. So you can't get that with with data center servers, even if you have you know a bunch of them. It's still going to be very challenging. I guess it comes down to volume, right? I mean, if you have a few thousand records, yeah, of course you can do that. Uh, but uh, also there, there that that's that's just the scalability question. Then, of course, is the question of intellectual property, and uh, you know, uh, w will these models be uh, accessible so you can modify them, or will they be, you know, integrated in such a way like it is today with SQL Server, where you don't you don't see the innards. So uh, there's all those kind of things because the models are tweakable. You can change the code for spe specific purposes. So there's a lot of unknowns, but I would imagine that some subset would make it to SQL Server, but I can't imagine all of it would because it would not be practical. Well, uh, Nick, we are uh, reaching the end of our time here, and uh, your session has been inspiring and exciting. I think uh, kind of like the end of the IoT session we did with Clint uh, several months back, it left us all thinking about what we could come up with to test this out and to... Uh, jump in and test the water and uh, what that's a very very good closing thing so here here we go so we're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the session by saying Nick you've spent time researching this and you're obviously spending time uh, on a few different projects that you've shared with us before without sharing anything that you don't want to uh, describe publicly uh, what got your interest started in this and what have you been trying to uh, to achieve Sure. So uh, one of the, the products that we are building with WenHub uh, is a, a mobile app that's called Approach. And the purpose of Approach is actually very simple. Uh, let's say a bunch of us are getting together for lunch. One of the things that we want to know is when is everybody going to get here? So with Approach, what you do is uh, one, uh, one person sends out an invitation to everyone else. You, you get a text message with a link. You accept it. And now everyone on a map can see each person as they are driving towards the destination. So you don't have to answer the question, when are you, you know, you don't say I'm going to be five minutes late or I'm almost there. Also, you can't lie to people when you say you're on the road when you're actually still having, you know, your breakfast or whatever. So approach is about knowing when people are going to arrive. And what I wanted to do was incorporate some machine learning in there to let the group know uh, that uh, Clint is going to be late because of uh, you know the, the traffic problems etc. But then I started thinking, what what other things could I do? And I wanted to make it a bit more fun. So I uh, wanted to through machine learning, uh, once people in a group indicate who is most likely to be last uh, to keep people waiting etc. Et and add some some levity to 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 that also. So I want to so so that's basically approach, and uh, we're going to have it in the app store. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, uh, but I don't know how long they'll take to, to review it. But that's the first one of our apps. Uh, we, we are creating a platform, uh, not just for users, but for developers also, to integrate and make everything related to date and time super uh, simple. So we integrate with Google, uh, Calendar, uh, but when I say integrate, you can do, for example, bi-directional sync via our, our API. Uh, we have things like uh, rich media, so you can have a schedule and have an event and then have everyone tweet the photos directly to the same calendar. And we are creating visualization engines for different ways to look at date and time, et cetera. So I see, I see machine learning uh, being very helpful in things like schedules, et cetera, to be able to predict uh, things that you would otherwise not be able to do. So that's kind of uh, the, uh, 
the answer. But primarily with approach, I wanted to use machine learning to predict, uh, you know, when people will be there beyond just the drive time. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Nick. This is an exciting uh, window into something that we're all going to think about for a while. And uh, if if we start uh, playing with some things and uh, and getting some machine learning data decisions coming out of it, we'll be sure to uh, post those back to the side and post those back to you. Um, I I credit you already with getting my developers several years ago started with uh, Angular and uh, Firebase and several other things. And I wonder if in a couple of years, I'm going to come back and say that uh, this was the one you showed me uh, machine learning. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to Nick Appreciate it. for not only putting this together for us, but also giving this introduction. Um, all right, um, David and, and Michael, so on time here, when you mentioned 8.30 to me just a moment ago, was that because we need to be out of here in 10 minutes? Or is it because... Uh, as long as we don't go past nine. All right, so um, we have uh, really just a, a little bit of information uh, to go through here. I could spend time. Um, so we're still seeing Nick. Oh, right, here we go. Gotcha. And we are already sharing. There we go. All right. Um, so what I will do is uh, just a, a quick overview. I don't want to um, spend half an hour where I uh, might have spent about half an hour uh, going through the DNNCon highlights. Uh, we'll chalk that up uh, partly to me um, uh, barreling down the road to get here. On my computer I have some of the screens and uh, photos and things that I pulled together from not only uh, pictures that I was taking at DNNCon, but uh, ones that I pulled off of Twitter for us to kind of run through and talk about. Um, and uh, we can spend some more time uh, debriefing on uh, DNNCon afterwards. So. Uh, let's put that forward to one of our next sessions, and I'll spend a little bit more time, um, and I'll give an abbreviated uh, kind of run through here. Um, also, for those of us who uh, did make it up to uh, DNNCon, I'll um, uh, give everybody, you know, Clint and, and David, an opportunity to chime in and talk about some of their favorite things from DNNCon and some of their favorite takeaways. But uh, kind of running through the uh, running through the outline that I had prepared, we should start off by uh, talking a little bit about the sponsors that were there at DNNCon. Let me this down a little bit. All right. Uh, so for DNNCon, we had uh, a fantastic event that was put on. Uh, Joseph Craig is online. Um, I'm sure he's heckling us here now. Uh, the hard part of his organization work is over now, and he gets to uh, just watch the buzz and the ripples that have uh, uh, come out from the DNNCon event. Um, but uh, in addition to thanking uh, Joseph Craig for putting that on, we of course have our primary sponsor, uh, Manage.com, who was um, you know, the main sponsor who helped make this possible. Uh, we can't say enough about them. Uh, participating and being involved in the community, and when I get over to some videos in a moment, I'll uh, I'll reference reference uh, manage.com again. Um, some of the other sponsors that were there around um, in the uh, sponsor table, uh, I can uh, remember clearly uh, the folks from Ten Pound Gorilla uh, representing. They had booth with uh, plenty of activity going on, uh, some great giveaways as well. Uh, we had DNN for Less, who had a lot of different uh, things uh, that they packed the bags with. Um, for those who didn't make it up to DNNCon, in just a moment, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share some of the swag here uh, in that I have a couple of bags and I have a couple of handouts. for So for everybody who's here in the room, um, I'll, I'll be passing out a few things. Uh, Gravity Works uh, was uh, right next to me at a, for, for a good couple of uh, sessions um, of, of me hanging out in the sponsor area. Uh, technically, they were also catty corner to where David was sitting. Uh, so Gravity Works uh, was one of the sponsors and participated. Uh, David and, and his crew from Visionative was also one of the major sponsors. Uh, they are not only just uh, manning a booth, but also helping uh, put on the event and uh, helping Joseph with organizing it. So uh, we need to make a good shout out to David. Um, Spiffy uh, was there, and if you... got to adopt one of the spiffy scarves, and uh, that is a proud thing from, uh, I don't know, I think introduced at the second DNN con or third DNN con down uh, in Florida. They had these scarves as part of uh, that event, 
and uh, I was uh, glad to see them uh, pop back up again because everybody talks about these and one of these, and you were able to come up and adopt uh, a scarf. And uh, I do have a few here to hand out to uh, to lucky uh, uh, Southern Fried folks here here in person. Uh, uh, I'm going to butcher the name of uh, Patapsco uh, here. Um, but uh, we had other sponsors as well, and I'll kind of run through these real quick. Uh, most of these I think of in terms of people and uh, folks that I know. We had Tony Carter and his crew. We had uh, Sprocket. Uh, we had um, Adderson from DeskPal. Uh, Mitch was, of course, presenting, and so we had Ira Gurus. Uh, we had Blue Bolt. We had Engage. Uh, we had Steady Rain, which I honestly don't remember if I ran across the Steady Rain person or if we just had items. Uh, trying to remember back through the... Uh, the run of people that we ran through and uh, met and had good times with. Um, kind of going to the event, and this is probably where I'll spend a little bit more time um, going through it in another session to uh, kind of um, outline. Um, but uh, talking about sessions and talking about things that occurred, um, we have plenty of uh, memories of the folks that we talked to and the sessions that we had. Some of these were uh, extended versions of things that we've seen in user group meetings, either ours or other people's as well. Um, but uh, I do at least want to mention that in our uh, just recently published videos section of the Southern Fried website, uh, we can show off some of the videos that Adderson put together. So if you didn't uh, attend or make it out to DNNCon, uh, we have several different uh, sessions that, uh, let me get two event videos here. Uh, several different sessions that we uh, can point out. Uh, number one, we of course have the fact that um, uh, Clint Patterson gave our keynote uh, address, and if you want to uh, go through and uh, and watch that and catch up our very own, uh, we're quite proud of him. Clint Patterson uh, doing us proud up in Baltimore. Uh, he gave the keynote. Uh, we have several of the uh, Ignite sessions uh, that were there, and um, we have things like uh, myself doing a, an Ignite session that was a, a redo of the one that I did in um, uh, Florida last time uh, about Don't Be Evil. We had uh, Cassidy from 10 Pound Gorilla uh, giving us a, an introduction to uh, remarketing and how to use that and uh, benefit from that in your sites. Uh, we had uh, Adderson uh, giving us a session on the Pomodoro time management system and uh, learning how to get more focus out of your time in a day. Uh, it's, it's worth trying out. I, I did, Adderson, uh, try that out the first Monday right afterwards, and I failed miserably at it. So um, I, I know that I, I've got to have some, some discipline and some more closed door to be able to uh, participate in that anymore. Um, we had um, Joe Brinkman uh, putting together a session that um, was uh, very entertaining, I think, uh, obviously uh, exciting. Kind of uh, dovetailing on a little bit of what Nick was talking about today about thinking of DNN as more than just a content management system and, and talking about it being the core or the brain for content that gets put out and consumed in multiple different locations. Um, so you're not just thinking about DNN as your server or DNN as your site management. It's your content management. And it has the ability to put that content out to lots of different places. So this was... Uh, Joe kind of challenging us to think outside the box and think about more about what we can do with DNN. Um, but if you don't watch any of the other sessions, uh, what I really want to uh, make sure that everybody pays attention to is uh, Ron's session. Um, we've not had an Ignite session uh, finish with uh, a guitar ballad uh, finishing it off, and Ron pulled that off with, uh, with flying colors. Uh, so he gets all the props for having the most awesome uh, Ignite session, and if you don't uh, watch any of the other Ignite sessions, I encourage you to watch this one, which is uh, his connection of why DNN 8 is like an octopus, and he pulls it off uh, pretty well. There's, there's some pretty compelling evidence that DNN 8 is very much like an octopus. Uh, we also learn how to say octopus plural, um, so that's worth watching the video for. If you don't know what it is, yeah, no, I'm not going to say it. You have to watch the video to see uh, what uh, octopus is plural. Um, so uh, just uh, as some other highlights, um, uh, kind of babbling on a little bit more about uh, things that we saw, community buzz and announcements. Um, there were uh, several folks uh, from across the pond uh, with us. We also had a representation of a lot of different folks um, that we know. A lot of the sponsors and a lot of the companies that we see at DNN Cons uh, were all there. But with a show of hands of, of the folks who were there, 
well, about 50% of the people who were attending this DNN con had never been to a DNN event before. Um, and uh, for me, that really helped um, reinforce uh, that resounding uh, need that we have regular community events, not only like our Hangouts and like our uh, user groups, but um, larger community-run uh, conventions have a purpose. Uh, when I talked with many of these different folks, they worked in government and county and, and federal organizations, and they had DNN websites that they managed, and several of them had started a job or moved into a position where they now had DNN, and they were told by their coworkers or bosses, Oh, as soon as there's another convention, you're going to go out for training. I'll send you out. It was about two years since the last one. And so they all talked about the fact that they wanted to come earlier if there had been an earlier convention. So um, there's there was a reiteration and a reinvigoration of commitment of seeing people participate and want to participate in activity, uh, community activities. And then from all of us in, involved, um, a... a uh, an excitement and, and a building up again of, of commitment to wanting to put on and participate in these kinds of events. Um, uh, we heard at least three or four different groups in, in different geographic areas um, talk about wanting to create brand new um, dynamic user groups. So we here are, you know, originally QC Doug and we're the Charlotte area and we've grown um, our focus and our scope to say that we're Southern Fried, so we're the Souths. Uh, DNN user group, um, but um, we've seen other user groups uh, with a lot of activity kind of uh, scale down and not have as much activity. This was really exciting to see because there were people all around saying that they wanted to get uh, involved and participate in user groups that either had uh, fallen silent and restart them again or just create brand new ones. Uh, probably the best example of that was um, from uh, you know, we, we have the Southeast, so we, we have grand ideas that we're, we're, we're the whole Southeast. But um, uh, we met a couple of folks uh, who wanted to create the entire African continent DNN user group. Um, that um, uh, that was uh, from uh, Clint. Uh, where were they from? So the other three from Nigeria and one from Cameroon. And essentially... Um, two of them came together and they knew each other and when they were in uh, one of the break rooms or bathroom areas, they met one of the other ones who they did not know and they also came from Nigeria. So we had um, you know, a strong presence of folks internationally, but in that situation, um, we met some very interesting folks with some very interesting stories and they all talked about wanting to put together uh, DNN user groups. So where we could, we put together uh, people with Will Stroll to help uh, shepherd that process along. and. Uh, those folks from Nigeria had a very interesting story about how their government and many government organizations are using .NET Nuke. And um, so I'm going to reach out to them and see if we can have them come on uh, a session with us and tell us a little bit about their, uh, their user experience and their story. Because uh, some of what we were hearing at the DNN After Dark uh, was very exciting and very uh, compelling the size and scale of what they're doing in some cases on DNN3 and DNN4 because of the servers that are involved. So it was some very exciting things uh, to hear and see uh, what, uh, what, they, what they're doing. Uh, Clint or David, do you want to uh, kind of add in anything there as we, uh, as we kind of wrap up? No, there is. Watch your video. Uh, your presentation many, many times because the content is <laughs> best key uh, the the uh, quotes from the crowd were best keynote that uh, we've heard in a while and please make sure you watch uh, Clint's keynote uh, because it is inspiring uh, about getting involved and participating in community and the benefits you get out of it and the benefits of course that the community gets out of it as well um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording for this session thanks again to our sponsors thanks again to Nick uh, for giving us an exciting presentation. Um, we'll make some updates uh, to the website and uh, post a recap of DNNCon there so we can post up some more involved things. I did promise several people that I was going to put up a good recap, not only collecting together videos, but links to the individual sessions and if people put up their materials from sessions. Um, so uh, do look for that here in the next month uh, of a uh, larger 
set of links and things for what you missed at DNNCon. So I'll go ahead and stop the session. Thanks, to everybody, for participating. Um, don't everybody in the room leave, though. I'm going to have some giveaways and some items to uh, come to. Online. So, okay, so then I won't stop uh, the session yet. We have the raffle going online. How so? We put some tickets for the folks online? Excellent. Okay, so then I will stop the recording, but we will continue on uh, with the folks online. So folks online, don't uh, leave yet. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, please uh, join us again here the uh, third Thursday in May. Uh, Dustin, can you give me a date or somebody give me a date here without me having to switch on the computer? Here? All right, we got May 19th as our next session. Um, we had on the hook Joe Brinkman. Um, we might be changing topics for what we're going to be talking with him about, but uh, we look forward to it either way and look forward to seeing you guys online uh, again. So stopping the recording.